I want to start with your thoughts uh, about last night's opening night of the DNC. Obviously, quite a lineup. Uh, lots of folks talking about former First Lady Michelle Obama and her remarks. Um, but then we also heard from a, quite the range. We heard from Bernie Sanders, uh, independent senator from Vermont, who ran a very progressive campaign. Well, I lost you there. Who may be independents uh, or Republicans to support this campaign. Yeah, I lost you for a second, Will, but um, I mean, Michelle Obama was incredible, right? Uh, she um, is just an amazing speaker and, and certainly uh, knows how to get to the heart of an issue, uh, which she did last night. But I think the real story of the evening was you know, a party that could have Bernie Sanders and John Kasich on the same stage opening our debate on the same evening. I mean, uh, it's just, uh, it really shows how broad the support is for Joe Biden uh, going into this general election. And that's a great story for the Democratic Party. If we're going to be the majority party, we have to, uh, you know, keep the majority of views uh, under our tent. And it shows just the the nationwide support um, for the vice president uh, at a time when we just, we've got to move past Donald Trump. And uh, you, you could see last night that we have the ingredients to do that. Now there's a long time between now and November, and that's why uh, we can't uh, take our foot off the gas. But the diversity of views, the perspectives that were offered uh, last night, um, that was really powerful. And then the, the young woman who um, you know shared the story uh, just heart wrenching story of losing her father to COVID. Um, you know, there were moments like that that were incredibly poignant as well. But um, I've always said about Joe Biden, he is a uniter. That's that's the thing. That's that's who he is. That's his, his leadership style. Uh, uh, look, he's not perfect. None of us are perfect. You can criticize this vote or that vote. Uh, but he's someone that people from all across this country can work with and relate to. And you saw that demonstrated in the convention lineup last night. Absolutely. I want to ask you as well, obviously last week was a big week when Joe Biden named Senator Kamala Harris to be his running mate. We're going to hear from her uh, later this week at the DNC. But what do you think about the way that that pick has kind of energized the campaign and what you've heard uh, from folks about that decision? I mean, it's been nothing but positive. Um, of course, there are, you know, racist people who will uh, attack her for this and that. And sadly, some of that is already coming out. But um, but. <clears throat> I mean, the energy and enthusiasm that's coming out of it has been just just fantastic. Um, and, and it really, it's just like Joe himself, I think it's a pick that unites uh, different parts of our party and, and even, you know, brings in some um, independents and Republicans, which, uh, which is really important. Um, she's someone who is not, you know, extreme one way or the other. She's uh, nuanced and thoughtful on the issues. She has had a remarkable career, a remarkable rise. Um, she's uh, accomplished a lot already and clearly represents the future potential, uh, not just of herself as a politician, but of so many Americans that she represents with her historic candidacy. Absolutely. Now, uh, for those of you who are just joining us, we now have our audio and video working uh, as we do this virtual week of live events. We're here with Congressman Seth Mullen, who represents Massachusetts' 6th Congressional District and is a Marine Corps uh, veteran to four combat tours in Iraq. We're going to turn now to some policy before we go back to uh, looking ahead at the rest of the week, sir. You know, there's a lot of outrage this week about what Donald Trump and his uh, donor slash crony turned postmaster general have been doing to try to undermine the Postal Service. The president himself has told us that this is a scheme uh, to prevent folks from voting by mail in this election. Congress is taking action this week. The speaker has announced that folks are going to be coming back to vote uh, or to send votes by proxy around some legislation. Can you get us up to speed uh, on what's happening on the Hill and what people can do to help uh, push uh, against what Donald Trump's doing with the Postal Service? It's unbelievable. And it's so blatantly anti-democratic. I mean, he's just been very explicit. He said, I'm trying to prevent people from voting in this election uh, by jamming up the Postal Service. So make no mistake about what he's doing. And it's not just rhetoric. I mean, postal um, sorting machines are being taken offline. Um, folks are being taken off overtime. Of course, there's a lot of mail right now anyway, because so many people are stuck at home. And it's not just mail for mail-in ballots, absentee ballots or whatever else. 
it's people getting their prescriptions. I get all of my prescriptions from the VA through the mail. But everybody who goes to the VA, every veteran in America who gets prescriptions from the VA gets them through the mail. It's about 100 percent. And so uh, he's putting lives at risk with what he's doing. And I think it's important to keep in mind, too, that, uh, look, I'm someone who's been uh, an occasional critic of the Postal Service and said, look, you can operate things more efficiently. There are ways that you can modernize. But the Postal Service is a service. It's a service. It's a public service to the American people. Should it be, could it be more run, uh, could it be run more efficiently, more businesslike? Sure. And we can work on those reforms. But this would be like going to um, the military. Uh, a lot of people on the on the call on the line now uh, understand uh, what it means to serve in the military. And there's a lot of calls all the time for reforming DOD, for making the military more efficient. I'm very proud to be a Marine. Are there ways the Marine Corps could be more efficient with its resources? Sure. But we would not imperil the fundamental mission of the Marine Corps just to improve efficiency. The mission has to come first. And the public service mission of the Postal Service is to deliver the mail in a timely way because Americans rely on it. And if you're counting on a prescription coming through the mail, like so many veterans who go to the VA, you literally rely on it for your life. So what Donald Trump is doing is just beyond the pale. It's abhorrent. It is anti-democratic, it's un-American, and it needs to stop. So I'm getting ready to go down to Washington. Uh, we're talking about what we can do uh, from the Hill, what, exactly what bill we'll be voting on um, uh, to... to to, you know, to, to provide some support here. But obviously, whatever we vote on in, in the House has got to pass through the Senate as well. And so there's a lot of work to be done here from a, on, a politi- on the political side in order to make sure that we can save the Postal Service. Absolutely. Yeah. And the reason that this is even an issue is because of the way this pandemic has gone unchecked you know, across our country and the importance of talking about voting by mail now. Um, 170,000 Americans have died. Uh, our economy is in a full-on crisis. What's the plan? Uh, you know, when Joe Biden's elected, we have Democratic control still of the House, and hopefully, uh, Mitch McConnell is no longer the majority leader in the Senate. What can we do uh, in that first, you know, 100, 200 days to help turn around what's happening with this federal response to COVID-19? You know, in a lot of ways, Will, this isn't that complicated. You just got to listen to the facts. You got to believe the science and you got to do some things that we all know, like we should be wearing masks. If everyone in the country wore masks, we could get this virus in check in a matter of weeks. Literally tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands more people would be alive today if we simply wore masks. But of course, the president played politics with that, just like he plays politics with just about everything else, especially when it comes to this pandemic. So what you're going to see out of Joe Biden is what you've seen out of Democrats in the House. Real leadership, listening to the experts, providing the support that we know the American people need, like the HEROES Act that we passed three months ago through the House, that goes to small businesses, that goes to the unemployed, that goes to nonprofits, to schools, to state and local governments, providing all the people the support that they need to get through this pandemic, as as opposed to just playing politics with it and trying to win elections based off people's lives. So it's not complicated. What you're gonna see is Joe Biden getting out there, telling the truth about this pandemic, telling every American what he or she needs to do to help stop it, and then working with Congress to deliver the aid that we all need. You know, no one looks back on the Great Depression and says, gee, the problem was that the federal government did too much or acted too quickly. No. We need to be doing more. We need to be doing it more quickly. And by the way, we do need to figure out how to pay for it down the road. I'm not just going to hand this bill to my daughter. Mm -hmm. But right now requires action. And that's what you're going to see out of a President Biden. Absolutely. Now, swiveling from what's happening here in the U.S. and looking at what's happened over the last three and a half years to our relationships around the world, to our national security, military readiness, and the president has toyed with having an in-person meeting with Vladimir Putin uh, ahead of November's election. And clearly, I mean, he's just ceded so many strategic uh, aims to our adversaries. What do you think, you know, as a national security leader, when you look ahead uh, at what needs to happen in a Biden administration to turn the tide 
uh, on our national security posture? What does that look like? And how can we rebuild what's been broken uh, in our allies and, and partners over the last few years? You know, I think we Democrats like to focus on all the things that President Obama accomplished, both at home and abroad, that uh, Donald Trump is shredding. But he's jeopardizing relationships that go back to Reagan, back to Eisenhower. I mean, this is how serious his assault on the international system is. And he's accomplished nothing, nothing. We've gained nothing from cozying up to Kim Jong-un in, in, in North Korea, from cozying up to Vladimir Putin in Russia. It's just emboldened them. We've gained nothing from pushing our historic allies like Germany, France, the UK, all our NATO allies away. He's done the exact opposite of, of our Marine Division motto when I was in the 1st Marine Division actually serving under then General Jim Mattis. Our motto was, no better friend, no worse enemy than the United States Marines. That meant that if you wanted to work with us, you'd find no better friend. But if you wanted to work against us, we'd fight you tooth and nail. Our allies knew they could trust us. Our enemies knew they could trust our resolve. That should be the United States national security policy writ large. And that's exactly what you'll see under Joe Biden. We know that because he's practiced foreign policy for a long time. And that's exactly how he's practiced it. He has relationships around the globe with our allies. But make no mistake, it's, it's going to take work to repair them. A lot of people around the world are, are wondering, was Donald Trump an aberration? Or is this some new trend in American politics? And perhaps after Joe Biden, it could happen again. So the damage that Trump has done to our credibility, to our fundamental trust as a nation, is fundamental. And the fact that he is so brazen in you know, playing around with Vladimir Putin right before the election, when it's proven that Putin is trying to get him reelected and contributed to his election in, in 2016, is just, again, it's just beyond the pale. It's unpatriotic, it's un-American, it's undemocratic, and that's why we've got to put a stop to it in November. Absolutely. Now, last question I want to ask you. Obviously, we've talked a lot about what's wrong and uh, why it's been a difficult past few years under Donald Trump. Uh, I've seen you on the campaign trouble in 2016 when you came up to New Hampshire to help us out uh, and help Maggie Hassan win that Senate seat. I've seen you uh, stump for our friend Mora uh, up in New Hampshire in 2018. You know, people who are involved, who are activists, uh, who want to help make a difference this year, why should they be excited and motivated and inspired about what we can do together uh, if we win this thing in November? Look, we got a lot of problems in America right now. We got a lot of things that need to change. Uh, we don't just need to put a stop to this pandemic, although that's right in front of our eyes. There's so many other issues that the pandemic has helped expose, like the massive racial justice issues uh, in our country that we obviously haven't grappled with and need to. And so this is a time when we have to do a lot. But the thing to remember about this country is that we've never been a country that gets it all right. At our best, we're a country that believes that we might, that we have that potential, that we're focused on the future. That by joining together, that by working together with the incredible array of Americans all across this country, we can accomplish more than ever been, has been done before. That's why we're a special country. But the point is that it takes work. It doesn't happen on its own. We have a great system of government, but it's not perfect. It requires good leadership. You're going to get good leadership out of Joe Biden in the White House, out of Kamala Harris in the White House. But every single one of us needs to contribute. And we should be excited to contribute because we can make a difference, because America can be better. Because when we all join together and believe in a brighter future, we can make that future a reality. And that makes a difference in other people's lives. You know, people ask me, Seth, you fought four tours in Iraq, but you disagreed with the war. You know, why would you go to Iraq, not just once, but four times if you disagreed with the war? And the answer is that I wanted to have a role in making it right. I wanted to be on the front lines, not at the back of the room complaining. I believed in my country. I believed that we could do better. And even in the midst of a war I disagreed with, every single day I was able to make a difference in the lives of others. That's how we should all think about our work going into November and our work coming out of it. That this country isn't perfect. We're not going to get everything right but we can pitch in and make a difference in the lives of others. 
And that's reward enough to get involved. Absolutely. Well said. Congressman Seth Moulton, thank you so much for joining us. Great to see you. Uh, hopefully we'll see you again uh, before November. As we work thank together. you, Will. <laughs> thank you so much, sir. We'll see you soon. All right. Thanks to everyone who's joining us. If you're just tuning in, you're watching our Boat Vets Live DNC special edition. Every day we're meeting with uh, senior national security leaders, members of Congress and others. Now we're going to turn to that senior national security leader panel for this morning. Two folks supporting Joe Biden for president, the Honorable Patrick J. Murphy, who's the 32nd Undersecretary of the Army, and retired Air Force Major General Trish Rose. Uh, you probably know both of these folks, but Patrick Murphy is America's first Iraq War veteran elected to the U.S. Congress, later served as the 32nd Undersecretary of the Army until January of 2017. Secretary Murphy is currently the Distinguished Chair at the United States Military Academy for Innovation at West Point and a senior fellow at the Association of the U.S. Army, a media executive and the executive chairman of Work Merck, an employee engagement company focused on the future of work. Trish Rose is a retired United States Air Force Major General. She joined the Air Force in 1984 and is the first openly LGBTQ officer to be promoted to Major General. Her assignments included mobilization assistance to the Director of Logistics, Engineering, and Security Assistance for U.S. Pacific Command and Mission Director for the U.S. Central Command Deployment and Distribution Operations Center in Southwest Asia, where she directed Joint Logistics for Operations Iraqi Freedom and Enduring Freedom. Sir and ma'am, thank you both for being here today. It's great to see you. And I think we got to... Uh, we got to make sure we got to unmute uh, both of you. So everyone. All right. I, I, there I we go. I, all right. Well, hey, it's great to be with you and uh, and the general. She's she's a personal hero of mine, and uh, it's a great day to be an American on day two of the Democratic National Convention. Absolutely. Indeed. Indeed. Uh, yeah. Well, thank you both so much for being here, and I apologize for uh, running a little late. You know, we are uh, with everybody working on uh our technical issues in this virtual world <laughs> and sir i don't know if it's just me but i think you're you're sideways on on uh oh, on my all right screen. i'll fix it but uh, <laughs> that's nothing compared to our our little audio snap hey there we go uh and we got the flag right there in the background it's awesome now you know we had a great conversation yesterday with uh mike smith and paul eaton both retired uh two stars about kind of our national security posture and, and what's at stake in this election I want to focus again, but with a particular focus on the U.S. military this morning, because you both have served at the highest levels of the military. Sir, you acting secretary of the Army, you know, undersecretary of the Army, ma'am, you as a general officer. Um, we'll start by kind of assessing what's happened over the last few years and then talk about what we can do to fix it and what that'll look like if we are able to uh, elect Joe Biden and Kamala Harris this November. Uh, so, Secretary Murphy, we'll start with you. We've seen a lot of chaos and dysfunction from this administration at the political appointee level over the last three and a half years. The resignation of Secretary Mattis, uh, really a failed nomination of Patrick Shanahan for his replacement. Three tries to name a SEC Army, Anthony uh, Tata being an unqualified bigot and a top policy job without Senate confirmation. And part of the president's job as commander in chief is to appoint leaders, uh, civilian leaders to work with our U.S. military, just like President Obama did when he selected you to serve. Can you talk a little bit about what the harm uh, has been to that relationship, to the civilian leadership of our military over the last few years and how Joe Biden would run DOD and the military services? Sure, well, and, and I'm sure the general would agree as would the over 2 million uh, active troops, as well as over 20 million American veterans out there, that the Department of Defense is the most apolitical of all the federal agencies. They're there to do a job to keep our family safe. And I think the record shows what we do when we're in charge as Democrats in that when it was President Obama, uh, he followed President Roosevelt's lead and had he had a team of rivals. He had folks from both sides of the aisle who served, uh, who were leaders uh, under President Obama. First, it was Secretary Gates, you know, who was the Secretary of Defense under President Bush. He asked him to stay on uh, and they worked very, very well together. Uh, and then you know, you look at right now, and it is disheartening because I think there's a lot of folks that, you know, see somewhat of the, the polarization uh, of our military. And it breaks my heart because there's a lot of good leaders, civilian leaders as well, within the Pentagon, doing their best to put our country first. Uh, but that's what Joe Biden will bring to the table, Will. He will have a team of rivals. He will have the best and the brightest 
to ensure that our military has a technical and tactical advantage over our enemy and ensure that our families are safe here at home and safe, whether it's with a global pandemic or hostile actions with foreign entities. Absolutely. And General Rose, I want to ask your perspective, similar question um, as a retired general officer. We have seen some senior uniform military officers put in terrible positions over the last three and a half years. Some have resigned. Uh, some like Lieutenant Colonel Vinman have had their promotions blocked. Others have, have gone along, tried to do the best they can, um, given the circumstances. What's your take on what's happened to our senior military ranks under Donald Trump? You know, this this concept of the civilian leadership of our military, both the, the president and the uh, people that the president appoints in the Pentagon, it's such an important concept for the United States of America because the expectation is the president will appoint competent, qualified people that can work collaboratively with the military officers. But, you know, not this man, because we know he doesn't listen to his generals, and quite frankly, that drives me bonkers when he says his generals like he's a child with little toys. He doesn't listen to uh, climate scientists. He doesn't listen to doctors. And, and all of these people are essential to our national security. Um, you know, instead, he inserts himself into the military justice system uh, by pardoning war criminals and then vilifies patriots like Colonel Vindman. You know, for me, I see that his actions continually undermined the trust and integrity, and those are the two key words, the trust and integrity uh, that we need up and down the chain uh, to have an effective military. And we all know it as military leaders that when you uh, break integrity, you salt the ground for a very long time. So as, as uh, Patrick mentioned, yes, it's going to take some time and effort to overcome uh, the, uh, the damage that he has done. Absolutely. And Secretary Murphy, part of this uh, that we've talked about a lot at Boat Vets is that our military personnel, the military itself, uh, has never come first for Donald Trump when there's a question where he thinks that it's in his domestic political interest um, to exploit folks, whether that's the you know, sending troops to the border ahead of the election, to try to hype up this you know, caravan Fox News kind of deal, um, the transgender troop ban as another one trying to appease, you know, radical evangelical folks. Um, it seems to be a trend. What do you think that's, that does on a daily basis to folks who are worried about, you know, their status, what immigrants in the military? I mean, these folks who have been under attack uh, from President Trump, what does that do to our readiness uh, uh, as a military on a daily basis? Well, there's no doubt that it, it's disheartening. Uh, it's disheartening uh, as those of us in this profession, the less than 1% of America who serve folks like yourself and General Rose uh, and so many others who are tuning in right now, we all put uh, our, our personal safety on the line to defend our country uh, and to see it become politicized, to see the malice against the U.S. Constitution uh, when it comes to very fundamental principles like, you know, liberty and equality uh, and justice, uh, the general mentioned, you know, the, the part of war criminals and, and to go against the very fabric of that special trust and confidence that the American people placed upon us who were the cloth of our country. Uh, it is disheartening. Uh, and that's why there's so many veterans uh, who are standing up. Uh, I just read yesterday there was a one of the leaders down in, um, in D.C. when we had the riots in Lafayette Park, when, uh, well, there weren't riots, it was a protest, a peaceful protest. And he talked about how we pushed him out using tear gas and using weapons just to, for a photo op. And he said, this was against the very fabric of what I learned at the Army War College. Uh, and that's why I feel the need to speak out right now. And again, he's an active member of our military. You know, that's the type of political courage we see from him, but also from Colonel Vindman and so many others. Uh, but when we see some of our own people, that was already mentioned, General Mattis, who said this president is a threat to the U.S. Constitution, uh, who was just disregarded and just frankly fired because he spoke up because President Trump was made the decision to turn our back on our allies, folks who stood with us shoulder to shoulder in the Middle East, especially northern Iraq and the border of Syria. 
So there are just so many others. Joe Biden comes from a military family. Both his sons served in our military. Uh, I was close with his son, Bo, who served as an officer uh, in our army. Uh, Bo and I ran for office together, and we won together back in 2006. Uh, him and Delaware and me in Pennsylvania. Uh, it, the time is now, though, to all stand up, to do what's necessary, to put our country back on the right track and elect Joe Biden as our next commander in chief. Absolutely. General Rose, I want to ask you a similar question. I mean, just this week, Secretary of Defense uh, Mark Esper has reported that he's eyeing a multi-billion dollar cut uh, for military health care spending. As a senior leader, how hard is it to keep uh, folks who are on active duty focused on the mission of their day when they're worried about their careers in the instance of transgender troops, their children with citizens issue uh, that the Trump administration brought up uh, or their health care? What does that do uh, in a unit? Well, you know, this conversation about cutting um, military health care during a pandemic, uh, it absolutely blows my mind. Um, how can anyone focus on the job that they need to do if they're worried uh, that they're not going to get their basic needs met for themselves and their family, but especially military members who volunteer, who sign up to put their life on the line, um, but we're not going to assure them health care. I mean, that's one hell of a recruiting poster right there. You can risk your life, but we're not going to give you health care. Sign me up for that. Sign me up for that. That sounds great. Um, really, this is about recruiting. Recruiting is already extraordinarily tough for our country. So many of our young Americans are not fit, uh, either for health reasons or mental health reasons. And, and we need to be able to bring our best and our brightest to us. This is not the way to do it, folks playing around with something so essential as their basic health care needs. I, I agree, our, our, someone said earlier that, you know, our military budget is huge, um, but there is some other fat that could be trimmed as, a, as opposed to, you know, this essential need for our active duty and our retirees and our disabled veterans. Um, this is a, it's a heinous conversation. I can't even believe we're having it right now. Yeah, absolutely, I mean, you know, part of, as you touched on there with the recruiting issue, ma'am, and part of the problem with what, what Donald Trump has done with the chaos show is that we're focused on, you know, what's the news of the day? I think that's true at the, at the Pentagon, too, from everything that we've seen, prevents us from actually tackling bigger problems like recruiting, solving, planning for the future. So I want to ask you both, when you look at the U.S. military and the services, what are some of those big challenges ahead that we'll need to tackle uh, once Joe Biden is elected? Secretary Murphy, we'll start with you, sir. Well, I, I think I think uh, the general, I think Trish hit it right on the head. I mean, most Americans don't have the propensity and the ability to serve right now because, frankly, the obesity uh, epidemic in, in our country uh, and the folks that, you know, that join our military, it's less than one percent. But they really come from the warrior class in America. Um, you know, my father served in Vietnam. My uncle served in Vietnam. Uh, my brother served two deployments. I served two deployments. But 78 uh, percent, about four and five Americans who do join our military, do come from military families. But, Will, the, the problem is, is that we're asking these young Americans time and time and time and time again to deploy. There's some veterans out there. There's some combat veterans that served 12 deployments. Uh, and, you know, it's breaking their families. The divorce rate is up, the suicide epidemic, et cetera. And again, I'm so proud of my military service. You know, I believe in post-traumatic growth. But we have an ethic that we leave no one behind. And we're leaving too many of our brothers and sisters behind right now. Uh, Trish hit it on the spot. Uh, we always got to take care of them, to them and their families when it comes to health care. But that national call of service that Joe Biden uh, has brought to the table, I'm looking forward to uh, He's going to talk about that call to serve your country. Again, again, not just in the military, but in the Peace Corps, for teaching of America. We do, you know, Mayor Pete, uh, Buttigieg talked about uh, that that ability to make true patriots who spend, whether it's a year or two after high school or college or grad school, to go back into our communities or overseas for our country, to be the face of America, the greatness of our country, that enthusiasm, that vigor to really make a difference in our communities and our country is what that call to action that I think we're going to hear from uh, Senator Biden or Vice President Biden 
uh, and that we'll see more importantly when he governs our great nation. Absolutely. General Rose, you already hit the recruiting piece. I want to ask you if you have another uh, item you throw out as a big challenge that we need to solve uh, looking ahead to the next 5, 10, 20 years for our military. Well, you know, I don't I don't have the crystal ball. And the, the problem with leadership like, you know, President Trump's is uh, I have a cat. He does this, you know, he puts a shiny thing over here. He says something outrageous and our, our media focuses on that. And then all of a sudden our real issues as a nation are not being addressed and, and worked in an intelligent manner. So I would just like to see some, some order and some focus uh, brought back into our national security strategy and, and our planning, uh, one that we can do collaboratively with our nations, our allies, uh, instead of continually pushing them away, as uh, Representative Moulton said earlier. Uh, getting back to being a respected nation on this planet is, is I think, one of the most paramount um, objectives for the Biden-Harris uh, administration. Absolutely. Now, two more questions for you each. But uh, first, I want to ask, Secretary Murphy, you served under President Obama and Vice President Biden uh, in the Pentagon. When you see Joe Biden and his campaign, uh, and from your experience working for him before, what makes you excited about this campaign and hopeful about what the future is going to look like when we put him in office uh, this November? What gets me most excited is that I've known I've known Joe Biden. Uh, we used to call him Pennsylvania's third senator. And, and him and Barack Obama had an incredible tenure. For eight years, our country was moving in the right direction. Whether it was with our economy that was in that double-digit unemployment, uh, the stock market was about 9,000. And they had six and a half years of job growth. Every single month for six and a half years. They leave it, stock market was from 9,000 to 24,000. And yeah, there was a couple thousand more points added to the stock mar market in a couple more months of job growth under President Trump. And then he's acting like he brought, you know, he was born on third base. And he's acting like, you know, he just hit a triple. Uh, and and he did that, you know, with, with our economy. It, it drives us nuts. And now we, again, we have double digit unemployment. And of course, there's no accountability, no ownership there uh, in the White House. So the reality of it is this, is that I'm most excited that I know he'll move our economy in the right direction. But it'll also bring back honor and integrity to our military. Uh, he will not try to abandon our transgender brothers and sisters. He will not try to, uh, you know, look the other way, you know, when one of our own does something heinous and commits a war crime. He's not going to uh, overstep the Secretary of the Navy and then fire that Secretary of the Navy because he believes in what we call the Uniform Code of Military Justice. That is the fiber that keeps us together as a team in incredibly hard situations. Uh, and I know that, you know, I'm speaking to the choir and not the congregation, what, what I mentioned is when I'm talking to my brothers and sisters at both vets, but I will tell you this, that when it's Joe Biden and Kamala Harris uh, in that White House, we will have honor and integrity back there and it will be focused, not just with his heart, but with his mind every day on making this country better and not what's in the best interest uh, of his personal organization in the private sector and his friends of the wealthiest 1% of America. General Rose, same question to you. Why are you excited about uh, Joe Biden? What can that future look like for uh, the, the airman or, or a woman who wants to join out of high school at age 17? What's that going to look like with a commander in chief Biden? Well, you, you know, we have a, a saying in the military, a, uh, a promotion is not a reward for past performance. It is an indication of future potential. And, uh, you know, I see, uh, Joe Biden getting promoted from vice president to president, not, not because of what he's done in the past, but because of where he is telling us we can go in the future. And uh, he'll be able to communicate that through the chain of command so that everybody can be in alignment behind that vision and take the actions necessary to bring it to life. And, and I will be very excited to, uh, you know, I, I won't be in that chain anymore, but I will be continuing to mentor those who are, and, and I'm excited for that future. I really need to be proud of my country's leadership again. 
Well said. Okay, rapid fire before we go. Uh, could you each name someone that you're excited to hear from at the DNC in prime time this week who we have not yet heard from? Secretary Murphy, I'll go to you first, sir. Well, as we have some rising rising stars uh, later today and, and great Americans like Connor Lamb, Congressman Lamb, Maureen, both vets supported 100%. Won a special election in a Trump district. He has a tough fight, but I know both vets and, and, and myself were standing with him shoulder to shoulder to make sure he gets reelected because he's such a leader of character. Uh, on prime time, though, I would say absolutely uh, President Obama. Uh, you know, him and Joe Biden, they had a bromance. I mean, th th those guys were th the ultimate tag team. Uh, I can't wait to hear him tomorrow night, Wednesday night, uh, going in um, to the last night uh, and hearing from Joe Biden himself. So uh, tomorrow night will be uh, Kamala Harris and then uh, Barack Obama uh, closing it out uh, on Wednesday night. And I, I just can't wait to hear that. Uh, but appreciate, Will, all that you're doing and both vets. And, uh, and it's an exciting time to be an American. Yeah, thank you, sir. All right, General Rose, who are you excited to hear from? Yeah, I don't, I, I heard from Michelle and Amy. I'm good. No, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. Seriously, you know what? I'm looking forward to hearing more of, of my fellow citizens. Those little vignettes last night from our fellow citizens telling stories that were so eloquent, like that. Uh, that 15 year old literary activist, Marley Diaz. I mean, she blew me away with her poise and her hope for the future, uh, her positive attitude. Um, but uh, I, I guess I am most looking forward to seeing Senator Harris and Vice President Biden. I want to see, as I said, that glimpse of a future where I can be proud of my country's leadership again. And like uh, Representative Clyburn said last night, we know Joe, and Joe knows us. And that's a great feeling. It really is. Absolutely. Secretary Patrick Murphy, General Trish Rose, thank you both uh, for everything you've done for this country, you. for everything you're doing in this election, for joining us. Stay safe. We'll see you both back here soon. Uh, nice to see you. Thanks. Thanks, Walt. Thanks, General. Bye, Thanks, Will. everybody. Thank you. All right. And last but certainly not least, we're going to turn to Leo Cruz, the Veterans and Military Families Engagement Director for the Biden-Harris Campaign, and Ron Pierce, Senior Advisor to the DNC for Veterans and Military Families Outreach, pulling him in right now. As you all know, Leo is a Navy vet with years of experience in state and national issue advocacy and electoral campaigns during the Obama administration. He served in DOD and in each of the service branches. Ron Pierce returns to the DNC from PBS after five years of serving as the Veterans Engagement VP at PBS. From 2011 to 2014, he served as the DNC's National Director of Veterans Outreach, Director of Small Business Outreach, and Deputy Director of Constituency Outreach, specifically in his work with veterans. Ron developed, organized, and managed the National Veterans and Military Families Outreach Program. He's a combat veteran, so 12 years, resigned his commission as a major. He's also a 1985 graduate of West Point. So, Leo, I'm sorry you are clearly outnumbered uh, this morning. <laughs> But good morning to you both. Welcome. Thank you for uh, starting from the delay with our, our technical issues. Ron, you and the DNC really had it uh, running tight last night. Uh, so we're going to learn from you as we, as we iterate. Uh, how are you guys doing today? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Great. All right. So the first question today is an easy one. I want to know what you both thought of last night's We the People opening uh, and the speeches that we heard. Leo, you're first. Uh, thanks, Will. And yes, uh, last night uh, showed us the diversity of our party, showed us the diversity of the issues that we are following. Um, and, you know, just a lot of great stuff shown. I think uh, General Rose had mentioned it about the, the little vignettes. Um, and I, I think Michelle Obama said it best when she said, you know, Donald Trump is the wrong president for our country. He has had more than enough time to prove that he can do the job, but he's clearly over his head. And he cannot meet this moment. He simply cannot be who we need him to be for us. And she said it. It is what it is. It is. Absolutely. All right, Ron, what did you think last night? Uh, it was amazing uh, and inspirational. And as Leo just mentioned, uh, Michelle Obama, she usually does. She brought it home and let us know that we needed to uh, vote like our lives depended on it. And it's, it's true. And as our nominee has said, you know, this is a fight and an election for the soul of our country and, and our democracy is at stake. So I would 
thought it was extremely well produced. No one knew what to expect from an unconvention, unconventional convention, but uh, very well done and echo the point that Leo made, you know, it showed the diversity of our party and our country and that's our strength. Absolutely. All right, Ron. Yesterday, Leo told us about the program he's building for the Biden campaign to reach and empower veterans and military families. Can you tell us about your work at the DNC and what the party's going to be doing through the election to also empower and mobilize veterans and military families? Sure. Uh, and, and one thing that we're doing very well uh, is working hand in hand at the DNC with the, the Biden campaign. We, we're concerted effort. But we're and I'm focused on uh, getting those party members, veterans and military families and communities within the battleground states to engage that community, activate them, reach out and talk to other veterans and military family members. Uh, we're working closely, as I said, with the Biden campaign, uh, who has put in a, a, a coalition of coordinated uh, campaigners uh, across the states and primarily battleground states. And they're all uh, are working together. So the communities that I have been talking to in the DNC have linked them up with the team that uh, Leo and the Biden campaign have put into the battleground states. Uh, and then link those entities up with the state party and the state party is taking the lead in those states and because uh, as you know well each state is different has different ways to talk and, and mobilize people so i think it's been working very well and that's been our uh focus my focus at the dnc absolutely now ron i also want to talk about your big event tonight uh it's the veterans and military families council meeting Tell us who's going to be there, what's the focus, and how can folks sign up? I don't think anybody wants to miss it. You know, it's, uh, it's going to be a great event. We've had a, a really um, impressive um, uh, list of RSVPs. I think we're pushing about 4,000 people and, and hope to uh, have more uh, this evening. But if you haven't registered or don't know about it, you can go to the Democratic Convention's national website, uh, this morning and uh, at the schedule, find a Veterans and Military Family Caucus meeting, which is at 5 p.m. Eastern, uh, register there, or just come back at 5 p.m. to that same website uh, at the Democratic Convention, find a schedule, and it'll be live streaming uh, right there. We have an amazing lineup uh, of uh, some special guests that I, I won't... Uh, reveal here, but we're going to be hearing from uh, various veterans and elected officials, Connor Lamb, uh, who's one of the keynote uh, speakers tonight, uh, a veteran, uh, Representative Crow, who's a, a rising star in our uh, party, Ted Lou. We're hearing from the badass women uh, of veterans, um, Representative Slock and, and Abigail Spamberger, Luria and uh, Houlihan. Uh, uh, as well as Secretary Rice, uh, and best, excuse me, Ambassador Rice and Secretary Albright. Uh, thank you, Will, for uh, agreeing, and we're looking forward to the Vote Vets community joining us. Um, you'll be speaking, and uh, you're going to have to bring it because you're, you're proceeding, Mr. Kazir Khan, as we all know, who is a star at the 2016 and has agreed to be our uh, quote unquote keynote. Uh, to close out our evening. So we're going to have some fun. We're going to provide tools for people to use in the, um, in the fall to help uh, mobilize and get out to vote. Uh, but it's going to be a very um, good uh, good run of show. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's going to be awesome. Uh, and I, I would encourage everyone to, we'll, we'll restate the link before we go, but everyone needs to go register and join us tonight uh, at 4 Central, 5 Eastern, and Leo, you're also throwing some sort of party tonight. Uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah, thanks, Will. Uh, every coalition has a, has one night out of all these nights for the convention to host a pre-watch party. Uh, we, we got the luck of the draw, so right after you go attend Ron, a uh, wonderful show that he's put together for, for the DNC Vets and Mill Family Council. Get a dinner break and then come right back at 8.30 Eastern, uh, and we'll share the link later, but... Uh, it's a shorter program. It's just a quick hour to pump or half hour to pump you up right before the, the main event. 
Uh, we'll also be having Ambassador Susan Rice. We'll have uh, Representative Joaquin Castro, uh, who is uh, on the Foreign uh, Affairs Committee and the Select Intel Committee. Uh, we'll have uh, a great Navy family uh, member, and I didn't do that because y'all were Army. I, she's just a great leader, uh, Sheila Stevens. And uh, to you know, even and out with 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 Army is is uh, Medal of Honor winner Flo Groberg will be joining us. Incredible, awesome, uh, and Leo, who do we have speaking uh, in the primetime lineup at the convention tonight? And who are you most looking forward to hearing from out of those folks? I, I mean, tonight we got a really great lineup, and and it's it's. It's hard to select who I want most, but obviously the, we saved the best for last. So we'll have uh, former U.S. Attorney General uh, Sally Yates, who followed the intel to find out that General Flynn was already colluding with the with the Russians before he even got to his desk at the White House. Uh, minority Senator, uh, Minority Leader Senator Chuck Schumer, who's been fighting for Americans to get the support they need during this crisis and uh, fighting against Mitch McConnell, who's more worried about protecting big businesses. We have former Secretary of State and Vietnam vet John Kerry. Uh, we have uh, Representative Ocasio, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, uh, who's a leading voice in our party, Delaware's own Representative Lisa Blunt Rochester. Uh, we have uh, the, the, uh, the great uh, former President Bill Clinton speaking. Uh, and then finally, just as Michelle Obama did last night, we'll have uh, Dr. Biden, uh, who's been a great supporter of our community, the military families, looking forward to reinvigorating Joining Forces 2.0, which is a program that her and Michelle Obama had started in, in, in the Obama-Biden White House, um, and really looking forward to her addressing the, the issues we face as a country, and, and particularly, you know, her main focus is on education uh, and, and families, particularly military families, uh, I think will be a key treat for us all. Absolutely. Okay, Ron, who are you excited out of that lineup? Who are you most looking forward to hearing from? Uh, I think I have to start with uh, Dr. Biden. Um, she knows our uh, nominee, uh, Vice President Biden, best uh, and can uh, present uh, his story and, and frame that debate. Uh, and as Leo mentioned, just what she and uh, Michelle Obama did uh, during the Obama-Biden administration and the Joining Forces initiatives uh, was very important. Uh, she's a great supporter of military families and veterans, so I'm looking forward to hearing from her. And as always, um, President Clinton, um, great speaker, knows how to frame a debate. And I just think uh, he will, uh, again, bring it home and uh, show the stark differences uh, of uh, Trump uh, against uh, Vice President Biden and, and close the case. So those two really uh, are going to excite uh, me and uh, looking forward to it. It should be a great evening. I think last night was was uh, great, and this is going to follow up. Absolutely. Okay, Leo, real quick before we have to go, give us a fun fact about uh, Vice President Biden, our nominee. Uh, yeah, well, well, I'm, I'm a sports guy, but uh, Joe Biden is a car guy, and so he has a 1967 Corvette Stingray that he got from his father who happened to work at the car dealership and gave it to his son as a wedding gift. And he's such a gearhead that he actually gets notifications on his iPhone from car and driver magazines. So if you're into cars, Joe's going to be your, your president. There you go. If you're into cars, you have to vote for Joe Biden. Uh, I like that rule. Uh, Leo Cruz, Ron Pierce, thanks for being here this morning. Everyone, make sure you. that you tune in for the DNC Veterans and Military Families Council meeting that Ron is leading. Uh, and Leo's Veterans and Military Friends from Biden watch party ahead of tonight's primetime lineup. Thank you both. Leo, we'll see you tomorrow. Ron, you're going to come back and join us on Friday to close out the week uh, and look back. So we're really excited about that. Thank you both. Tomorrow, right back here, we will have former Ambassador and Sergeant Major of the Marine Corps, John Estrada, Gold Star Families Leader, Kara Merritt, and once again, Leo with an update from the Biden campaign. To everyone watching, thanks for joining us. We will see you then. Have a great day. Don't forget to tune into today's events as we mark the 2020 DNC. And thanks for sticking with us through those technical difficulties at the beginning. We'll see you guys. Thank soon. you. Thanks. Bye.